thank you, welcome you all. I'm very astonished that so many people are here. Um, my talk is, is introduced, Petabyte CFFS for Satellite Data Processing. How has this talk uh, been generated? Uh, about exactly one year ago, I met uh, Gregory and Saj uh, at the meetup session here at this DevConf. And they, always, they said they always like user stories. And since we had one to provide, we, well, we said, okay, let's do it. Let's do a, uh, uh, let's talk about what we use CFFS for, since everybody always is talking about Ceph and doing the rather block device thing. And uh, most of them now also do the object gateway stuff. But the CFFS, are, uh, uh, at least uh, we feel, felt that's not really much in, in, in the public. So short uh, words to me, uh, I'm, my name is Martin Spiegel. I work for Cloudflight. That's a rebrand of Catalyst GmbH, individual software development in Austria. And yeah, I'm master of the cluster and I'm also not afraid of touching PHP, PHP sometimes. Um, I have basically three chapters for you, including final words. And uh, I tried to find a sensible phrase from a, a song I very, very much like, uh, Imagine, from John Lennon, so all courtesy for that, go to him. Imagine there's no heaven. The keyword here is heaven. Um, there is actually heaven above us. And a lot of companies actually do something there. So we have a lot of satellites there. We have, that's actually a picture of a satellite <coughs> called Sentinel-1A. Uh, it's part of the Copernicus program of the ESA, European Space Agency, uh, which has some instruments on board. Uh, in that case, specific, specifically, uh, they are radar instruments, so they're taking radar pictures. Um, and they produce a lot of data. Also, airplanes which fly around and have uh, here uh, an RGB camera on it and here a laser scanner, uh, they basically do something that's then called photogrammetry. So you take two pictures of the same area, roughly overlapping a little bit, and then you can calculate out of that. Uh, if you know the exact height and the, the different angle you have, you can do a 3D point uh, mesh wall uh, clouds. We will see later something of that. Um, so, and why did we start to do this data processing? Uh, we met the um, academic research group in France that were, they were doing an uh, algorithm that was called GRASP. That's the generalized retrieval of aerosol and surface properties. So basically, what do we have in the air? And the algorithm was apparently very great. They did find much more, they got much more out of the satellite data than everybody else did, but they had one problem. They were academics. So that's not per se a problem, but academics tend to do, uh, they're great in, in, in uh, developing algorithms, but they're not so great uh, in developing code that's fast. So they had a quite good code base which worked, but it took them very, very long to process such files. And then we came into play and we um, improved the speed of the uh, algorithm at the first stage about the factor of 100. So, and <coughs> Somehow that joint venture came and started, and then we met other companies which had basically the same problem. They had a good idea, they had good techniques, they had good algorithms, but they didn't have the know-how and didn't want to build it up. Uh, that also came up with the time. Uh, the knowledge to do this in a large scale. So, and yeah, what then happened, we did some processings for USC and OMATSAT and other stuff, and you yeah, know, to get you, an idea of what data do we process is here. These are concrete pictures. So the upper one uh, is from Sentinel-2 image. That's actually an image of Brno. Uh, Sentinel-2 has optical sensors in it, so you can do basically photographs. And you can then use that. Uh, here we have a 10 meter resolution at the ground level uh, to calculate something out of it. So you can try to detect particles in the atmosphere which fly over Brno. Another thing is here we have, uh, so that's the base material. And to give you roughly an idea of, of what we're talking about, uh, if it would take every day of uh, the satellite Sentinel-2A mission, uh, that would be roughly of every instrument that satellite has on it, we would have about roughly seven terabytes per day. So, and what we need to do is, to, so that we can process all that stuff, we need to massively parallelize that. So we built up also a compute cluster with a lot of compute um, uh, virtual machines, uh, and they do the, per, the, per, the concrete processing in parallel, but that also needs uh, some kind of storage which they can access in parallel. So they can share their 
in between products <laughs> it normally generates. So normally it's something like we do a first round on, on some picture sequences, then you have some um, midterm products, we then share that amongst the others because the other processes need that information to further iterate and gain speed. And so we apparently had something where we need shared storage. The next thing is uh, most of these algorithms, even the, those we own basically, so we have the, um, we can influence the code, um, they're not very object storage oriented, so that's not that easy to uh, rewrite them to use that. And there are also a lot of algorithms where we don't even have the source code for. So we can't even uh, say, yeah, well, okay, uh, file system access is bullshit, let's do it in an object oriented way, which would be most of the times better, but we can't do it and we can't use it there. So this wouldn't make sense to uh, go that path. So, and here uh, I tried to list from a S5P satellite, so there's a Sentinel 5P and a, a Sentinel 3A to give you an idea what the difference is between what we have here. We have, that's for exactly one day in uh, July 2019, this satellite produced 14 files. Exactly 14, we will see, we could see, can see here, uh, they are all basically roughly the same size all over the day. And then we had another satellite, the S Sentinel 3A. Also just a random day, in that case in the year 2018, we have 150,000 files. And we have 150,000 files, not only large uh, amount, but also ranging from 40K to 30 megabyte, something like that. Uh, why is that important? Because uh, normally you tend to do optimization also on a, um, block size level. So you want to say, okay, it would be optimal if all of my files, are, I don't know, 64K, then I could say I trim my strip size in the CephFS to 64K and then that would be quite good. That's not the case, that's not easily possible here. So not only that we have really huge difference in the products that we have to consume, but they are also in the products itself quite different. Uh, before we go any further, I would like to show you some products, what, what we make out of that. So that's actually, uh, this is a, a grasp uh, processing which shows three points in, that's, uh, where is it? The Cape of Rome, Milos and Sorta. Um, and what you can see here is the darker the blue, the less the air is polluted and uh, if it goes to red or uh, yellow, then air is very polluted. That's concrete for a project where they plan to do uh, certain research, uh, not uh, research, um, certain locations where people with uh, a lung obstru obstructions uh, can have a medical therapy. And there it's very important to not have uh, very polluted air. So that's something very concrete. Or here we have, uh, the smoke plumes in the atmosphere uh, in South America during the fires in the Amazon. So you can see here quite good. Here you have a lot of dust and pollution. This is a thing, the digital twin city of Frankfurt. That's something that's uh, generated out of photogrammetic uh, stuff. That's the thing where I said two overlapping pictures and then you can create uh, point clouds out of that. So here, that's still from the picture, and here you can already recognize that's the generated point cloud of that. We did that, uh, as you can see here for Frankfurt, we did that even for Munich. Uh, you can use that for, what can that be used? You can use that for uh, development of uh, country areas or of city areas. You can do it for concrete calculations, so you can now really measure by heart the, a point from here to that roof, something like that, forever what, what you need. Um, so, number points in the challenge, as I said before already, uh, most of the time we need to, to process the data every day since it's, since it's such a huge amount and we wouldn't come up or uh, to say with, with that if we wouldn't do the processings every day. Uh, we are not always in control of the algorithm source, so we can't easily say, okay, let's skip the file system part and use something else. So that, that also doesn't work out for us. Uh, since I said, we almost get seven, uh, roughly about seven terabyte per day into our storage. 
uh, we, we, we need something that's scalable up to a very large level because uh, project lead some time, point in time said, okay, I always need the last 10 years of a lot of satellites and a lot of satellites mean a lot of data. Uh, it shall be cost driven. So that's another thing. Uh, we didn't want to buy, I don't want to name some concrete vendors, but large boxes uh, where we have pictures afterwards. Uh, we shall be lean and agile, so it should be easy, so this was the main <coughs> idea, uh, to change things. So don't have, buy a product where you can just do things just in one way and in no other. So that immediately led us to, it's easy if you try it. The keyword here is trying. Uh, we didn't say, well, uh, let some vendors get us some sales representatives and then we just buy what, they, what, what has the best price. We said, okay, we want to evaluate it. And what did we evaluate? First of all is, of course, we had uh, to think about classic or new age. What do I mean by that? Classic is, for me, the, the rack storage. You buy from some vendors on large and buy one, two, three, four of them and live with the shortcomings they have. Uh, the new age would be software-defined storage with all uh, its inclinations. And we, from, from the beginning, said, okay, we want something that is at least able to do block and file storage. Object store we didn't care so much about, uh, just has to provide an access path in terms of block and file storage. Low cost on any hardware is also fine because we didn't want to get a vendor login. We didn't want to get into a situation where at some point in time uh, we suddenly recognize, oh my fuck, we can't, own, we can't buy anything else than HP or something like that. Um, we, have, we wanted the flexibility to access it in multiple ways, and of course the scalability was also a very important fact. What we took a look on, so what we evaluated on the paper, that really was on paper, just reading through the docs and trying to uh, see if that fits for us, where last RFS, it were uh, IBM Spectrum, that was actually GPFS code back then, uh, there were a cluster, and okay, there was Ceph. So that were the ones that, um, came out for us. Um, then we had the discussion, do we want something like closed source that would have been GPFS? GPFS basically does its job quite good as far as I'm told. I mean, it's expensive, yeah? Uh, you just can scale if you buy more licenses and these licenses aren't quite cheap. Um, but at least it does its job quite good. But then we said, okay, we, everywhere else we build an open source. So why should we start doing it here in another way? So that immediately led to the extinction of, of GPFS. Um, then we said, okay, we saw there's ex exactly one product. That was the main difference of Ceph between all others, at least for us, which says or claims uh, data integrity is an in uh, a vital part of the solution. It's not that we say, okay, we do the, the distribution thing and stuff, and there would have been Lustre also okay or so, uh, but we, and the, the, for the data integrity, at the end of the day, the rate controller is responsible or something like that. That was the only solution that did that. We needed POSIX compliance on the file system level. Uh, yeah, and that led to the fact that we wanted to use Ceph. What we did then is we said, okay, let's establish a plan. We at least, let's try one more, uh, one other file system. Uh, what I meant is then forget about plan, life doesn't like them. Um, I don't know exactly the time frame anymore. After roughly about two months of testing, uh, so we, we built up a test setup where we could uh, throw away everything in a few minutes and build up a new cluster. So that was what was done for Ceph and for cluster. Uh, but at the end of the day, to be honest, we just tested Ceph. <laughs> it was okay. It worked out. Now, uh, we had some colleagues which already did a cluster FS before and we consulted them and then they said, okay, well, for that, what you need, go with that. Um, so, this is just a uh, Gregory, thankfully, already explained the basics of Ceph for itself, so, so I don't have to explain that anymore. Uh, this is uh, roughly how does CephFS work. So we have a data pool. A data pool is a logical unit in the Ceph uh, construct, which has a crush rule be behind it, which uh, determines where objects should be placed. Uh, we have a metadata pool, and we have here the client, and we have the things that's called uh, metadata servers. These are actually the ones uh, which know where files live. So basically that's the idea, uh, to, to put it quite frankly. 
this was just needed to tell you something else. Then we had the evaluation of hardware. So what can you do there? You can read white papers. There are actually a lot of vendors right now out there uh, which already have something like, uh, yeah, that's the perfect Ceph solution. Uh, we have, we can sell you a whole Ceph rack for that and, and stuff like that and have uh, network suppliers like Mellanox or so they provide you with a lot of white papers. So that's our basic idea of idle Ceph cluster, stuff like that. I mean, you can read through all that, you can check the prices, you have to find a way of trade off So that's basically something where we said, okay, we need a lot of storage, so this, this is one of the main ideas. It's not that easy to create a Ceph cluster, not, uh, doesn't mind if it's just for block storage or something else, which is the uh, multi animal which can do anything, so you have to find a trade off between performance, between high IOPS, between uh, uh, large storage amount. This is something you have to decide basically for yourself. And at the end of the day, what proved out for us, the, the, the only thing to really work out is try it. Buy or uh, talk to your vendor if he can give you a pre-sale uh, demo object and then try it. That's it. Uh, these pictures are here to show you what we have right now in the class is actually HPE and super micro devices. Uh, we tried both of them, yeah. As said before, we don't want to get in a vendor logging, they work. That's basically, it. it's, it's, it's not like that that would have say, yeah, the one is better than the other, don't care really much. Um, what we did actually, uh, as I said before, we did a lot of load and performance tests. That's, that's really uh, something you should do. Uh, and the most important thing is you should identify your workload. So how will your access pattern be? That's crucial, because otherwise you might run into the situation where you say, hey, I have a perfect cluster and it's a quite good file system, a distributed one, and your users say, yeah, well, that's fine, and we have a lot of storage, but actually the performance, yeah, it's not that good. Uh, so what we did is uh, we created an automated suite, uh, roughly it can look something like that, so FAB uh, is a Python thing which can a, a Python SSH scheduler. He can schedule jobs for you and different messages uh, executed over SSH. And there we had, as you can see here, this is just for one scenario, a lot of fire jobs. So fire is a utility which just can measure uh, in a large scale and with a lot of uh, threads and stuff like that, multiple scenarios for reading, writing files. So that's what we did. What we said, okay, that's where we, what we want to use. And what we also did, we didn't just test it from one node. We said, well, at the end of the day, there will be 20, 30, 40 uh, compute nodes which will access this file system in parallel. So we have to test it in parallel. So we had to build up all that stuff. Uh, and yeah, and then run the test suites. And the outcome of such test suites is then exactly such a graph where we can see, yeah, uh, back then to that point in time where from where this graph is, is we had the cluster built up with four storage nodes because we needed the other ones for the virtual machines to provide the, the uh, compute VMs. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it's quite impressive already. With a, s a certain number of threads accumulated, you get around roughly 3,500 megabytes per second, which is good because it was a uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet network connection between them. So, no hell below us. <laughs> Uh, how I wish that sentence would have been true a, lo a lot of times. <laughs> uh, what were our challenges when we got that stuff into production? First of all, I have to say, we immediately switched basically with the final testing cluster into production. So we didn't rebuild it, uh, we did, did not a re rebuild. We just said, okay, so it's working fine, the settings are good, let's get that stuff running. Uh, Actually, uh, it would have been wise, we would have done it uh, from scratch. But, well, it was like that because we already had uh, some 100 uh, terabyte on data on it. Um, we had one thing when we started all the trial phase, uh, we were in a data center where certain environment circumstances were not optimal, let's say. Um, they had problems with the power supplies, they had problems with the air condition, so that actually led to a lot of outage of our nodes. And the uh, outage actually happened during a lot of write and read scenarios. So, and 
another thing to say, we used, we didn't re use Red Hat self storage, we used the, the upstream pro project, and we used it in a way back then when even their CephFS was not marked as, as production ready. So it's not to blame CephFS for that, that something happened back then, uh, but it just happened. Uh, we didn't actually notice it until some point in time, some colleagues said, hey, well, I did, uh, I, I, didn't, uh, I did start a processing, but it didn't work out. There were some errors. Can you take a look at it? And then we suddenly noticed, yeah, actually we have some loose leaves in our file system tree where we have a directory fragmentation. Um, yeah, about half of the facts, first of all, we didn't care all too much because these were, as you can see, perhaps on the uh, directory name, something temp files. <laughs> um, we didn't need them, so that was basically not that problem. Uh, but we had somehow to deal with it because otherwise they got problems, the co colleagues which did the processing. Um, and it f roughly the half of that we could, crea uh, could uh, fix with, a with, with uh, Ceph provided utilities, and the other half we actually really had to, to kick manually some objects. So we had to identify which object means that in the metadata pool and had to remove it, of course, during the metadata server was stopped and then started again. Uh, one thing, then we also had to notice, yeah, you should choose some settings wisely up front. Uh, the layer drive, uh, layer free size <laughs> and range, uh, you will like to use for the front end network. Optimally, in an optimal world, you have a front end and a back end network in a Ceph cluster. Uh, the front end network is that that is facing to the clients. Uh, so also for ZFS, that's also true. Um, and we started with way too less, so we had to uh, afterwards blow it up to a slash 18 we have right now that works until now. Uh, actually, we started with a slash 24, which uh, after, I don't know exactly more anymore, think about it. after one month, we had too much hosts for that. And then we sh then somebody had a great idea. Yeah, well, let's then, let's uh, route it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this doesn't work out in terms of performance very well, so uh, that's not the best thing. Um, pool assignments to directories. So if you're like us and you say, okay, you have different uh, important products. So have the in-between products, as I said before, you have the end product, which are very valuable because you uh, invested, I don't know, three months, four months of processing time into that, and you won't do that easily again. Uh, then they are very valuable. So we created uh, some different pools where we said, okay, here we have a higher replication factor, here we can work with erasure coded things, uh, with uh, different importance levels, and we assigned these pools to different directories. So there's something you can do in CFFS, you can say, okay, this directory or even this file uh, should be in that pool. That's quite a cooler thing, and you mean you can even do more. You can not only can say I want the pool, you can also can define the stripe unit, the stripe count, the object size. Um, the thing only is, uh, if you do that, and uh, that is used uh, uh, in a recursively way, so the sub 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 directory of this directory would also have the setting pool CFFS data, as, as, uh, as long as I don't define somewhere in between the path a different setting for that. Um, the only thing is, uh, if you change it afterwards, it doesn't have an immediate impact. So if I would change for that directory, uh, okay, now go to a different pool, it would not happen uh, by magic that in the background somehow Ceph manages to move all the objects from pool A to pool B. It's only applied for new files in there. So if you want to do that, you would have to copy that file, you set it on the directory first, copy the file, remove the old file. That would work out. Then you would have it in the file in the new pool, uh, which is not quite easy if you have a few, a few millions or billions of files. So choose that up front. You definitely want to have some monitoring. So we had basically everything in there. We started with Inkscope, that was at the time of Infernalis, something like that. Uh, Inkscope is a, a project, or was a project, I think they are not active anymore, uh, which had uh, something like a, a quite a mix of uh, just dashboards and graphics and a little bit of control of the cluster also. Um, we don't use that anymore. 
Then we had uh, we established a homebrew Prometheus uh, Grafana stack, which is still in use today. Uh, then there exists also the solution provided stack, since Nautilus, uh, I would say it's also usable. <laughs> Uh, uh, before that, it's, it wasn't this. So this uh, screenshot you can see is from the solution provider section so from Ceph itself. Uh, that is, is our main dashboard uh, of Grafana for that thing. And what we also do did is we integrated that into our chat thing. So we have alerting rules in the Prometheus, uh, which uh, tell us if something is going wrong. So I just made a sequence here uh, where it says, yeah, okay, this OSD is dangerously full. Uh, or we also have something like the, this compute node or that or that storage node uses too much memory, stuff like that. That's quite fine because it directly ge uh, gets into a chat uh, channel where all of the team members can react to that. <coughs> Erasure coding. Uh, yeah, the gross net ratio versus performance thingy. Um, we definitely have some product trees or file system trees or directory trees in there. Uh, which we want to keep for a longer time, but we don't want to spend all too much in terms of uh, grow, uh, gross, ratio, gross net ratio on it. So normally we would say, okay, for that importance of that, we would do uh, at least a replication factor of three or four. Some, uh, sometimes we even talked about five. But then uh, I said to my project, yeah, well, actually, well, you know what it means. That means we have to fi buy five times the amount of storage you really want, you really can use. I say, okay, that's that's not that good, so we have to use erasure coding. Um, yeah, back then when we started with all of that, it was not doable to use uh, directly um, an erasure coded pool for it, uh, some CFFS directory. What we had to do back then was uh, we had to add a cache tire, which is in, in terms of, again, a, a replicated pool. And that, again, has immediate impact on the performance of all of that. Uh, since Luminous, I think, yeah, I think it was Luminous, uh, you can directly use erasure coded uh, pools, but only if you're on blue store. This was important. Then you can use, uh, and we do that right now, uh, then you can use uh, erasure coded pools directly for some uh, CFS directories. Another thing uh, we didn't start with, we had to learn it also the hard way, was you will like flash storage. And you will love it, uh, at least for the metadata pools and the journaling, if the journaling, if you're on Firestore, but even on if you're using BlueStore, you will love it. Uh, to give you a roughly an idea, they show measurements of a concrete uh, processing uh, run when we had no flash storage for the metadata pool and we had an, that was the commit latency in average of 16 milliseconds. Uh, that's quite high. Uh, when we established uh, the flash storage, we dropped that to 70 microseconds. That's a factor of 228. It's really impressive. And you immediately know that it's it. It feels way more fluid if you use it on the command line and stuff like that. That's, that's really great. Um, yeah, this was something I was talking about, uh, performance influencing parts. Uh, we have something, <laughs> uh, well, let's say a usage pattern in that whole cluster we call uh, making a Holter. Holter is the name of a colleague, <laughs> uh, which actually had the, the, the gift uh, to bring the, the cluster to its edge. <laughs> so <laughs> this somehow got an <laughs> insider joke. Uh, and we had to react on that, and what we did was simply to separate uh, uh, performance influencing parts away from, from other stuff that's important. So we created different crush rules, uh, which make a separation between block devices and CephFS. Uh, we also have different crush rules, so different pools with different crush rules for home directories of the users on, on certain uh, virtual machines, whereas the satellite data, and that's what you can see here basically. So we have the CFFS data pool, that's crush rule zero, which should, no, that's not, that, that's the default rule still. Uh, then we have CFFS metadata, that's crush rule three, that's that one here, where we use a, replica, a replicated pool uh, based on NVMe <coughs> storage. And this notation here is a class notation, which tells uh, the crush algorithm to use only the devices <laughs> of that class. And then we have again here for the 
Rather Flux devices for OpenShift, uh, for all OpenShift instances where we use it, but also for the Cinder volumes, since we are also using OpenStack. Uh, Rush Rule 4, that's that one here, where we say, okay, uh, we separated some hard disks, some OSDs, just for that usage, so that the performance impact, or when somebody does a halter on the file system, doesn't impact the virtual machines uh, in OpenStack. Uh, maintenance, yeah. Uh, you have to deal with version updates and upgrades. The cluster size changes, we started with one petabyte. Uh, we're right now at three and a half petabyte. Uh, next round is coming this year, so then it will be something about four to five petabyte. Uh, it's nothing you should take uh, easily and you should uh, think about it at all. So if you just would do it in a plain way, get the new node, stuff it in, start it up, uh, your cluster will immediately work and it will everything will be fine basically, but you will notice performance impact. So we did that in a steered way so that we can control uh, during night, we, laid, uh, we, we used the cluster balancer also for that, the upmap feature, so that during night, where n not a lot of people are working there, except the, the processing that, that are running, uh, we can do the rebalancing and stuff like that. Another thing we had to decide a little bit is the rebalancing by placement groups or by, by usage, by volume usage. Uh, it would be ideal if uh, we could use by placement group. Uh, we can't actually use it since we have a, a quite large diff uh, then of the usage on, this, on certain OSDs. Um, yeah, then we had some outages. Uh, I told you before about the, uh, the things with the power supplies and with the cooling systems. But uh, beneath that, we also had a semi-broken network cable. That, that was really nasty. Uh, since it actually was working a little bit. Uh, but when you put load on it, it suddenly started to generate media errors, but not in a way that you would have seen it on the TCP uh, P stack. Uh, you just could see it in some certain proc subsystem, uh, sys subsystem of the kernel where it says the Mellanox OFED thingy starts to count up. Uh, the impact on the performance was, uh, was, was, re was really large. Uh, we had some uh, active MDS and crashes. Again, not fault of the product itself. This was during a time when it still wasn't ma marked as stable. And yeah, we had other problems with the hardware too. Disks break, I mean, not like that. But every, you have to be aware, every rotating disk will, they are used quite heavily. And at some point in time, they will tell you, now I'm done. I'm at the end of the, my lifetime, you have to replace me. Um, general hardware fails. So our advice is if you start to do something like that and that range and, and that scale, uh, have spa spare parts at hand. It might be that uh, in two or three years when your cluster is running, uh, um, and at least if you're like us and you didn't buy the, the super expensive vendor stuff uh, and had the, uh, not the support contract with 10 years, with 24 seven, stuff like that, uh, then you should put some spare parts uh, beside and lay that stock. Um, yeah, the, what still do we have here? Oh, that's a picture for France, you like it. Uh, blue store rules. <laughs> it's another thing that's, that's quite important. You want to use blue store. There's no reason, if, at least we believe so, to use uh, file store anymore. Uh, sadly, these graphs here uh, have not the same scale factor. Here we go from 0 to 250, and here we have from 0 to 12,000, something like that. That's the maximum latency we notice. These three nodes are still file store nodes during a concrete processing run, <coughs> where CFFS is heavily used, and these three nodes uh, are already on blue store. So you can see we also have a, fact a factor of 100, something like that. No, it's not 100, uh, but very high. So you definitely want to use that. Use cases. I can't really tell you how much time I spend talking with all the guys who will use that cluster in a specific CFFS uh, in the next time. And uh, how they told me, yeah, we need that. We will have that workload. We will have that access pattern. And we will need, that was the best thing. We will just need that much in storage. Forget it. I don't know if they do it on purpose or not, but they basically are lying to you. Uh, 
a few days ago, we had an, an appointment in an academic environment where the, <laughs> the IT leader guy there was telling us, uh, give an academic guy some storage, he will fill it up in no more than two days. <laughs> and second thing is he will not be uh, satisfied with the performance he gets. So that's the, the, the bottom line you can take with you. Uh, always think a little bit even for them. And another thing is, of course, also the use cases evolve over time. We had a, um, since one and a half years, something like that, we're working with a company from Germany which has also acquired a good algorithm doing in this photogrammetric stuff. Uh, but as said before already, they have some really weird access pattern. For example, they have some uh, what are 400 byte in size uh, control files which are dynamically created but only at the beginning of a processing run. During the processing run they stay the same. But what they do is since they, we have performance there, problems there and I analyze them and I saw, well actually uh, they are opening and reading these 400 bytes during a sequence of 10 seconds 12,000 times. Well. This is not really good on a, on, on a file system of that uh, type. Um, last thing is here, security implication and concerns of CFFS. Yeah, um, I would not actually use it as a public file store for anything. Um, there is a quite, as the, the thing that annoys us the most is the loose coupling of pool and POSIX permissions. So if I have I am the user who has basically some kind of a key, so there is an access management in Ceph, uh, that allows me to access the pool A. Uh, then I can, if I know what I'm doing, read anything in there. At the end of the day, all the data that is in there are uh, objects. And as long as I'm allowed to read the pool, which I apparently have to be, otherwise I couldn't use it as a Ceph file system, uh, I can read also data which I should not be able to read in terms of POSIX permissions. So that's, that's a thing that's not that good. Uh, I'm coming a little bit to the end. Above us only sky is uh, the current solution. So what do we have right now? We have, as I said before, OpenStack. Uh, it also uses the same cluster there. Apparently, we are using the block devices. Why do we use OpenStack? Because we have quite dynamically be, a be able to uh, throw away all that compute uh, virtual machines and regenerate them. Um, this works quite well with uh, OpenStack. We have some Terraform receipts in place for that. So to give you an idea, uh, 2072 uh, uh, processing virtual machines, which actually take half of the cluster resources, and that's already something about 1,700 CPUs and mm, nine terabyte of uh, random access memory, uh, are generated in five minutes. So that's quite cool since we can provide the colleagues which actually do the processing a way to say, okay, throw everything away, let's start from scratch and you can do use some other algorithm or stuff like that. Um, yeah, we use the Ansible thing for uh, setting up OpenStack on itself. Then we use Ansible also for provisioning or setting up the, the uh, virtual machine after the Terraform thing has created them. You're using Foreman for inventory management and bootstrapping the whole node. So there's also a thing we can get a new node, doesn't matter if it's a storage node or it's if a carpet node or something else into our cluster system in roughly about 10 minutes. So that's the time it takes just for formatting the disk and setting up the operating system and stuff like that. Uh, and then we have uh, our colleagues that created a glue code uh, user interface, the processing portal, uh, which has some quite unique features, I think. It can integrate into other independent computing facilities. So we have uh, comp uh, companies which are part of us, which do the same stuff basically as we do on different uh, products. So they're using GPFS or and, and VMware or stuff like that. Um, whole thing is container based. Uh, Slurm is used. Slurm, if somebody knows it, is a job scheduler on the, in the Unix world, uh, largely used in an academic environment. Um, and yeah, the thing with the different importance of files I already told you before, that's how you can see AI. This screenshot I have here, because we can see here one thing. What all of this uh, portal does 
it heavily, really heavily uses the Ceph file system. So under the mount point slash media slash, slash scratch, uh, that's actually CephFS. And uh, CephFS is, because it's working that good, for us at least, uh, also used uh, to do the uh, orchestration stuff in there. So that really works out well. Yeah, and you get nice graphics out of that. Yeah. You may say that I'm a dreamer. <laughs> we are at my final words, basically. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the, the cluster in the upper part, so exact, most exactly half that thing here is the Ceph storage, and the other half is the compute nodes. Um, resiliency. We survived, really, multiple outages with almost no interaction, immediate manual interaction necessary. So there were wrong fuses and power strips, there were the cooling system failures, there were disk, dying disks, crashing OSDs. Uh, we even had once the, the, the part where exactly in half of the cluster, since we were talking uh, uh, up front of stretch clusters, was gone away because uh, the power system failed. Uh, of course, at that point, certain point in time, it didn't work. <laughs> but uh, the cool thing about it was uh, we didn't have to do anything after the power uh, came back. Uh, I don't know the time frame exactly anymore. I say something like two or three hours, something like that. Everything was green again. With no admin doing anything. I had a similar situation at another company where we had the, the classic old school rack storage solution. Uh, they had to work uh, five days until everything was good again. So that's quite impressive and proved us that resilience is definitely a factor. Another thing I want to give you on the way is documentation. Uh, don't just rely on the documentation. I, I mean, Ceph is a really great product. The documentation does not really reflect <laughs> that, in my opinion. <laughs> but I, I told you that last year already. Uh, I mean, on the other side, to be honest, a lot of people always claim that it's better to use open source software because you have the source and you have the power and stuff like that. And how do they use it? Do they ever read one line of code? So we have to take our, ourselves on our, at our nose and say, okay, if you're using that and we're claiming that's cool, then really use it. And don't blame the docs if you, there is something working different than it actually should. I mean, okay, docs should also be up to date, but yeah. And last thing is don't underestimate the complexity. Uh, it took us quite a while to really tame that beast in that scale. I mean, the hello world thing is done in a few minutes. That's working. It's cool. Uh, but in that scale, you will most likely have other problems. Yeah, since I like to end my talks always with some meaningful phrase, and you might already have noticed, uh, I'm a little bit older. I'm from the last millennium, and I also like the old stuff. Uh, and I adopted a little bit uh, a thing, uh, a phrase from, from uh, the song Imagine. Uh, and the storage will work as well. <laughs> so, that's it from my side. Thank you for your... <laughs> questions. I hope I can give answers. Do you have any backup? Sorry? Do you have any backup or everything is... Do you have any backup of the data? Ah, okay. The question was, uh, do we have any backup of the data? Actually, to be honest, no. That's by, by concept. So, so we've said, if we would really talk about uh, backing up uh, free dot, so what the satellite data actually is, roughly is it's free dot one petabyte right now, uh, it would not be restorable in a sensible amount of time. So you have to, to trust in the system itself and choose your settings, your reputation, your erasure coding stuff in a way that you're safe and the failure domains and stuff like that. So it's, we, d we don't use uh, f failure domain of uh, OSD level. Right now we are still on, on host level and the next iteration we'll, we will move the failure domain to rack level. And what happens if someone accidentally deletes something? Then it's gone. <laughs> so it's gone, yeah. yeah. That's it. So that's the, uh, the this you have, we, we, we deal basically with that uh, symptom on a organization. So for all the question was, uh, what happens if somebody accidentally deletes something? Um, yeah, well, there is, there is stuff you should not be, you should really not delete, since it's important, since I don't know, six months of uh, processing are in there. 
this stuff is put into a place automatically where it's just read only for everybody else except a few elements. That's the way we deal with it. <laughs> I mean, we could also talk there, yeah, we could talk about doing a classical backup system. You can use a Boreos or I don't know how all the others are called. There's the company which now owns Red Hat, which also has a product in place, the storage manager, uh, backup manager, Tivori something, I don't know where anymore. Uh, it, uh, with that amount of data, it would be possible since we're talking there about roughly 50 terabytes or something like that. But yeah, for everything else, this simply won't work out. I have a question about the hardware specification. Mm -hmm. What is exactly your hardware specification? What exactly? So the question... There is a server with only NVMI drives. OK. The question was, what is exactly our hardware spe specification and if there is a server with only NVMe drives? Uh, right now, we don't have a... That's the first easy part. We don't have a server with just NVMe drives. Uh, we're right now in... Right now, actually, uh, um, organizing them. But they won't be just NVMe, yeah, it will NVMe U2 drives that it will be. So, yeah, right now we are thinking about the pure flash storage part of the cluster since we have some workloads with databases and stuff like that where we definitely can benefit from the high IOPS thing of that. And the cool thing is, again, I mean, we still have to see if it really works out. In theory, it should work out to be let that be also part of that cluster. Uh, for the other nodes, it's as said before, we have basically yeah, roughly the same, two, the storage nodes are 256 gigabyte of uh, memory, um, a CPU with two CPUs with 14 real cores, so that's uh, 28, 5, 56 vCPUs uh, with around 2.7 gigahertz, something like that. Uh, and the one nodes uh, on the left side we saw have 24 disks. Uh, normally roughly about 10 terabyte, uh, and the other nodes have 36 disks. You shouldn't put m really more than 36 disks. And that's also only for a, a cluster with, uh, which is volume-based, should be volume-based. So it's around how many cores per one OSD process? Uh, I <laughs> really would have to look. Um, but more than one, yeah? Yeah, more than one it was, okay. but I don't know exactly the calculation formula okay. anymore by heart at least. Okay. Um, yeah. Is that answer your question? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so what have disqualified cluster FS? So, <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, what has disqualified cluster FS? Um, well, we, as said before, one demand was to have different access paths and we really uh, wanted so that was the uh, hard demand, uh, block storage and file storage. And at that point in time, we didn't trust the block storage component of cluster very much. So this was the disqualification basically. Uh -huh. And the other thing was that we also said, okay, we're getting, uh, we're getting uh, the file system, uh, not the file system, the, the Swift S3 compatible layer for free. Uh, so yeah. We will definitely need that some point in the future. Now we have OpenShift 4 very much. Uh, we're very much using that. We even use it, used it, uh, don't think, after one week of last year's uh, DevConf. Uh, so we hacked it together that it somehow got installed. And then we will need, uh, there is a colleague out there which already should be working on that, that we have the, <laughs> the S3 part running in next week or something like that. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it made sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, some more? Fine, then thanks from my side, still have a great left off.